Hello everyone, I can see um, lots of people must have been waiting in the background, the, the numbers are going up and up and up. I'd like to say welcome to everybody that's joined us and I'm pleased that people have registered for this event. This is a, a joint meeting with IWA and the Leeds and Liverpool Canal Society. It's the first time that we've had such a, such a joint meeting by, by Zoom, but it's not going to be the last and I'll tell you about the the next meeting later on. I don't want to say too much, but I'd like to I'd like to uh, introduce Mike Clark. Mike Clark is the president of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal Society, and he has got uh, lots of books in his background, whereas I've got my uh, dresser in my dining room. And I know he's, he's got something to say at the end of the meeting about a book that he has recently um, just, just launched. But he's written, Mike has written lots of books. So when I stop talking, I'm going to disappear off your screen, but I will still be here. So if anybody's got any questions, as I say, any problems in the chat box, questions in the Q&A box. So I am going to turn myself off now but I will be here in the background and I'm going to hand you over to Mike. There you go Mike. Thank you Wendy and uh, well, a warm welcome from up here in Barn Oldswick and it's uh, the wonders of modern science that we can speak to people all over the country. Uh, this talk is one I've, I've put together really looking at where canals came from and how they developed. Uh, we always tend to think of canals, you know, or books are often put canals as something started by the Duke of Bridgewater and uh, they only started in this country. And that's something I'd really like to sort of challenge. Uh, and I think, or I'm hoping you'll find that when uh, we get into the talk. So if I go into share screen, and I'll get right to the beginning. There we are. And I just thought I'd start with a picture of, of my old boat uh, back in the 1970s, when Worsley really ha did have a proper orange water that uh, has done away with now. But really, what I hope to do is look at how we, we got to the stage of having this sort of canal um, serving the industries around the country. And if we think about it, I mean, water transport has always been used. Uh, it's not a, a new idea, it didn't, wasn't suddenly discovered. Um, people have been using rivers for millennia really um, and these are just a couple of pictures to suggest that the, the top one is on the Czech German border uh, where the barges are tying up waiting for customs clearance uh, so in the 1990s um, before EU regulations allowed people to, to cross borders um, and so you, you would have had transport on the main rivers. Uh, it was even more controlled historically uh, than it is now. There were perhaps 20 odd places where you had to pay tolls on the Rhine and Moselle, um, going from the upper parts of Moselle down to um, the North Sea. So this idea of, of people having to stop and having controls is very old. Though of course the other sorts of um, traffic, which was the sort of local goods, typical by down here, this um, where you have land drainage and agricultural produce going on. Uh, people always used boats for moving the vegetables and things like that to market. This is one in Saint-Omer in the north of France, uh, but there are several areas in France like this uh, that you can still go and see boats moving about. 
but the idea, you know, the, I said this idea goes right back, but even in places uh, like Greece in the sixth century BC, they developed this, in effect, railway uh, which carried boats across the Corinth in, uh, Peninsula. Um, other, other, it saved them having to go all the way around the Corinth. Uh, and it was, it, it, only, it only lasted for a short time, I think, uh, or it suggested. Uh, and it was eventually sort of replicated by the Corinth Canal. The Corinth Canal is alongside it and destroyed parts of this Diolkos tramway uh, when it was built. But there are in, in Europe, the ideas of building structures to help boat transport goes back to the sixth century. Uh, the Romans obviously had ideas about um, developing water transport. This is the Iron Gates uh, in um, near to sort of Belgrade uh, in what's now Serbia. Uh, it's now filled with water because of the hydroelectric scheme, but to get past the, the iron gates, which are the uh, sort of narrow, the, the narrows and um, the rocky area in the gorge, the Emperor Trajan built a towpath uh, right the way through the gorge. Unfortunately, most of it's been submerged now, but he actually cut it into the rock sides of the cliffs. Um, and there is a memorial to him, which was moved when the, uh, the hydroelectric scheme was built and the, the valley was filled with water. But there's another one going back 100 AD. And there are lots of things that the Romans did um, this is the remains of a Roman river barge uh, at Alphen, which is in the Netherlands, uh, that was uncovered. Um, that I think is from around right about the same time, 100 or 200 AD. And there are, there are lots of forts uh, built alongside the river. This is a typical one, uh, slightly built out so that uh, they could stop any traffic going along. And the, the Romans had sort of quite advanced ideas. One of them was here in France uh, on the right hand side, the Saône Moselle Canal, um, which would have linked up the Mediterranean with the North Sea. Uh, and it was the first proposal of that sort of scale. Um, but nothing was ever really done in starting construction work on it. And if you're going back into earlier times, we, we, we can't really forget the Chinese who developed a major inland waterway system. Uh, this section of canal, it, it's now been bypassed, but that, that's from about 450 BC. Um, this is a little bit in, in Yangzhou, uh, which is on the, close to the, to the Yangtze River. It's just here centrally on the map. Um, the original scheme was this dotted line which went up to um, Zhengzhou, which was the sort of capital of China. Uh, but China has really major problems with water control. And up until about 1300 AD, the Yellow River went down its conventional route, what we see as its conventional route, uh, into the Baha'i Gulf. But in uh, 13, about 1350, because of the silt brought down by the Yellow River, uh, the lower sections became completely blocked and the river broke through to the south. Uh, so that it came out to the south of the uh, Shandong Peninsula here, so that the mouth moved perhaps 500 miles 
uh, and the the river stayed in in that route um, until about 1850 when it changed again because of this silting up and flipped back to its original route to the north. So the Chinese have had incredible problems with controlling their water uh, for transport and irrigation. But there are quite a few things to see. That This is on the right hand side, the Jiangman lock. Most locks are in China was just single gates. And this was the sort of gate system there. You can find them on old maps. Um, this is the Yellow River where the, the Grand Canal enters the Yellow River. Um, there's a system here of uh, these single gate locks and they protect the canal from the silt coming in off the river. Uh, so th there are various different types. Uh, they, they did develop what could be called, very loosely called, a chamber lock, but certainly they, they were never widely used. N in China, nearly all their locks were these single gates. Uh, they were called stop logs, a bit like stop planks uh, to us. And that's because the, the rivers or the canals were also used for water supply, irrigation, and flood prevention. Uh, one of the canals that was actually used principally for transport was the Rouge Canal here, uh, which links up an agricultural area uh, in, the, in the south on the uh, Yangtze River. And it was cut through this sandstone ridge which is why it got its name as the Rouge Canal, the Red Canal. It opened in 1390, and there were bridges over the top, which were just the sort of stones left in. Um, it's sort of a bit of a tourist attraction, but principally for Chinese people. But if you ever want to go to China, it's something to go and have a look at. It's every bit as interesting as the Grand Canal. But the, 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 these ideas from China, I don't think really came over to uh, Europe and influenced us. The Roman ideas were sort of forgotten uh, until the end of the first millennium when Charlemagne built his canal to link the Danube to the river Mine. It's here, uh, the blue area on the map is the Danube watershed and the brown or yellowy one is the Rhine. And he wanted to link the two. Uh, most of it was done by rivers, but there was a short section of canal built. This is it here, uh, still surviving. Um, it was never heavily used. We think that perhaps uh, he moved his army from the Danube area through to the north uh, into Germany around about 793, and it may have been used a little for trade. Uh, not, not a lot is known. There were no locks on it. The boats were moved over rollers on uh, sort of inclines. Um, and they were, they were probably quite small, perhaps a little bit bigger than this, but that sort of idea of a flat bottom boat with not very high sides, which were typical of those used on uh, rivers at the time. And coming into the, the second millennium, we start to get much greater interest in controlling water. Uh, the top photograph is Governolo, on the, in the Po Valley, uh, south of Milan. And there they, they certainly built um, control mechanisms through which boats could pass uh, to go from one side of the flood pr protection to another. Um, it was in, in the, this governor area, 
but it, it's disappeared, but it, it was rebuilt. Um, this system developed in the sort of 19th century when they had quite large locks and flood protection barriers. Uh, further north in the Low Countries, they also started developing um, flood prevention, water control systems. And I do like this sort of 13th century little drawing with uh, a sluice gate there. And this type of sluice gate were, would be developed into something that a boat could pass through. One of, one of the, the, the main reasons for carrying goods, or the, one of the main goods to be carried, was salt. Uh, there were salt mines up in the uh, north of Germany, in the Lu Lubeck area, uh, Lu Luneburg Heath, and to improve transport for them, they built the Stecknitz Fart. Uh, this is one of the locks there are, there are a couple of locks surviving this is this is the only one and i'll just change my uh, well, I haven't got the, uh, this is what, one of the locks that they were in the main flash locks uh the waterway opened in 1398 but its importance is that it was a summit level canal so from Lauenburg on the Elbe, boats worked up to the summit and then back down to uh, Lübeck, where today they still have the salt warehouses, um, a little bit later than 1398, but pretty old from this sort of trade. Uh, this was the lock keeper's house. Uh, it used to be a, a bed and breakfast, so I managed to stop there, but it's now can, been put back to a, a private house. It was a very simple waterway, and groups of boats would pass through perhaps six or eight at a time uh, once a week uh, because of the, the time it took for the levels to build up again. So there were salt trade further down, uh, further south. This is Obendorf, just near to Salzburg. Um, and there was a lot of salt traffic here, going down the river, down to the Danube, where it could um, be distributed. And getting salt further north uh, across the watershed was one reason for the development of water transport in the Danube area. Obendorf uh, was an area where a lot of boatmen lived, uh, but we probably know it better uh, through the carol Silent Night, which was actually composed by the, uh, the rector in the, the chapel at Obendorf. And so from there we start to get you have more and more development which takes in boats. Uh, the Low Countries in particular uh, developed flood preve prevention, which was linked to, um, the, to boats passing through. So at the bottom, we've got Sparn down. The earliest lock here, uh, again, single gate, uh, developed in about 1250. 1300. And this is a more modern um, reconstruction of it. Uh, the car there is traveling along the flood bank. And on the other side, it was a tidal river. And the gates there were to protect the low lying land, uh, land from being inundated. Vrieswick uh, was another one. It originally started with a, a single gate, and you can see there this sort of remnants of a, a lifting gate, um, still survived in 1585 when it was converted into a chamber lock. So these ideas, the ideas of 
using locks to transport or to move boats from one level to another were quite well known by the, the 16th century. Um, I believe I have fa recently found that there is one of these gates surviving in Belgium, which I'll, I'll have to go and have a look at. And again, in, in the, the Low Countries, they did all, all sorts of things. This is one of my favourite canal sites, uh, Tienhofen, uh, near to Utrecht. And it's got a simple shallow lock and the water mill was for pumping from one level to another. Um, they built a lot of turf canals. Uh, if, if you know some of the, the canals in the uh, East Anglia, they're very much influenced by this type of design where you don't need to have a, a good foundation. It's on very silty land. And by having a box, you can make something uh, for gates to fit in. Uh, another early example is, is Berg in the north of France near to Dunkirk. And there they, they started, or you can see how controlling water has been used for military purposes, uh, providing moats to go around towns. And they had systems for flooding areas should the, uh, there be an army coming to um, try to invade them. So all these ideas, we've got flood tidal uh, protection, river flooding, agriculture, military, they're all being used to develop this idea of how you control water. And the idea of boats going through them is there right from the start. The, the, the story then sort of moves to Italy, the, the north of Italy, and the Milan area. And for some reason on the Canal de Berguardo, when that was built, they introduced the chamber lock. And I've still not really been able to get my head around why all of a sudden this idea of the chamber lock develops uh, on a canal which was never really short of water. It was provided uh, by water from a river, uh, quite a major river coming off the, the Alps. And the water was used for irrigation as well. This is the big rice growing area of Italy. And so it, the water was used for flooding fields. But for some reason, the engineer uh, decided that he, he or built using these chamber locks. Uh, they, they did sort of almost materialize, materialize out of nothing. Um, up until then, people were just using single gates. In 1458, when the Canal de Berguardo opened, they began using chamber locks. And the idea was, was sort of taken up uh, by Leonardo da Vinci about 40 years later, <coughs> or 30 years later, <coughs> when he was developing his canals uh, around the center of Milan. <coughs> and this lock is one of the ones that he uh, built and developed. The paddle gear in the gates is his particular design. But we know he, he didn't actually invent the chamber lock. That was developed 30 years before he got involved. Uh, but he built several canals in the Milan area and then got on the, the wrong side of the uh, controlling family and was thrown out. And he was taken in by the King of France in about 1510. And the King of France gave him a, a chateau by the Loire. I'm sure we'd all like that. Um, but when he was there, he suddenly started bringing his ideas about water. And he 
proposed some early canals in the area. It didn't actually build anything, but if you go there, there are surviving bits. Um, the first waterway where they started to use at least one chamber lock was the Villain, uh, which is the one that sort of cuts Brittany off from the rest of France. And these are paintings that were done in the 1550s, showing flash locks on the right and a chamber lock on the left. So I'm pretty certain that Leonardo da Vinci brought his ideas over there. If you go and have a look at the, uh, the Tue River, there's a navigation, it's about 10 miles in length, and they still have these rather unusual shaped locks where I'm pretty certain this started off at the upper end as a single gate flash lock, and as the ideas of using chamber locks developed, they added on these side walls and a, a bottom gate. They're really interesting that uh, I can recommend going to have a look at those as an early survival of the development of canal engineering. And of course, from those waterways come the first modern canals, the Canal du Midi and the Canal de Briere. <clears throat> Canal de Briere's first one, this is the Seven Rise Flight of Locks at uh, Rogny. Again, they're really interesting because they have been extended in length. I mean, how do you go about extending uh, riser locks? But they added on about three feet to each lock. So the, the sill has got progressively further and further down. And you can actually see where the old gates were and where they've had to put in uh, or lengthen the ground paddles. The ground paddles were only on one side. So France really became the centre for canal engineering in, <clears throat> in the sort of 17th century. And you can see where, the, where these two canals were. Again, we've got Canal de Briere, that's on a watershed between the Loire water in the green and the Seine in the red. The Canal de Midi is slightly different in that it, it just goes, <coughs> um, it, it does cross a watershed, but it's not in the, the, the same sort of style. Uh, and it was built to link the Mediterranean with the Bay of Biscay. Uh, it was never really successful. Uh, Rike, the engineer, did manage to build a chateau out of it, and, but uh, the government had to really take it over, uh, as they did with the Canal de Briere. <coughs> the the Midi didn't carry an awful lot of goods, um, but the Canal de Briere was quite important for carrying wood and later coal from the Loire Valley up into Paris in the top and it also carried grain to feed Paris, uh, and being France, it also carried a lot of uh, wine, and there's wine storage uh, alongside some of the locks uh, at Briere. So in the Low Countries, going back to them, I mean, this is one of the problems, it is that things were happening all over Europe, uh, but in the Low Countries, they developed really quite important systems of transport. Um, it was called a Bertfart, and it involved mainly rivers and coastal. And they used to be a fantastic museum uh, where all the boats that had been sort of discovered in the farmland that was recovered uh, when they fill or reclaim the Zyder Zay, things were brought up and they were preserved, but that they were like time capsules and they were just filled with everything from the clothes that the, uh, the families wore to all the possessions. I think they're now at Lelystadt, but it's another thing that's well, well worth going to see. And it, <clears throat> these are all 
boats that were used just for tr local trade uh, around the coast and going reasonably well inland. But the real important thing uh, about the Low Countries is they developed the Trekvart system again in the early 17th century. And these were canals, often dead straight like this one, um, and they were used for trek shoots, and that was purely for carrying passengers and small parcels. These trek farts were not really used for uh, commercial boats carrying goods. Um, but what they did is they opened up the whole of the country to uh, economic development. It allowed money, um, the orders and people to go around, uh, to look at things to buy. And once they'd bought them, they were then sent by the <coughs> Bert Fart uh, to their destination. But this track fart system, you can see by the end of the, or the middle of the uh, 17th century, it covered all the, the whole of the sort of coastal lands in what we now think of as, as the Netherlands. These are some of the, the boats that we use. They were, I say, passenger boats. And they allowed people to, to trade. And because of the track part, or one of, one of the reasons for the development of the Low Countries as the economic powerhouse of Europe in the 17th century was seen to be this track part. They also had their colonies as we did, um, but their banking systems and the ways of dealing with money were much in advance of ours. And that relied quite a bit on this track part system. But the 17th century was also the time of the Thirty Years' War, uh, which completely devastated the center of Europe. This sort of area, it's, it was fought to a great extent on the, on the sort of German state in the center. And this little map shows the loss in population. So up here on the, the northern coast of Germany, and the northern parts of Bavaria and some of that, you've got over 60% loss in population. Economically, the whole of the center uh, of Europe was decimated and France and Spain were also hard hit uh, because they, they'd have to be funding all the, the armies that were going out fighting. So the Thirty Years' War was catastrophic for uh, a Europe which was already being able to develop its ideas about inland transport. So this is from a 1609 Italian book which shows um, one of the, the locks uh, proposed on, on one of the rivers in the, in the north of Italy. And these ideas are, are about the, uh, the use of inland waterways were actually published. Uh, Johann Joachim Becker here was published a book in 1688, Politische Discourse, uh, in which he really says we've got to look to what they've been doing in the Low Countries with these Trekvart systems and building inland waterways is the way to a strong economy. And if we want to get over the financial problems of the Thirty Years' War, we need to be start thinking about building inland waterways. Becker actually ended up, he, he, he was a, an alchemist and quite a, an interesting chap, he, but he ended up in England uh, and he gave lectures at the Royal Society and he did actually die in this country in about 1692. 
But his, his ideas, he, he, he published uh, when he was living in um, Vienna and he, he developed these economic ideas for the Habsburgs in particular. And they were taken up by another chap called uh, Lothario Vogemont, who published this treatise on sort of stable commerce in Germany uh, by making rivers navigable. Uh, it was first published in about 1700 in Latin, and then there were editions. This is the Italian one, there's a German one, a French one. And he, he again was saying, what we need to do is to build inland waterways. And so this, quite a few of them were promoted around about that time. This is Austria before 1770. Uh, and you can see they've got quite a lot of ones planned. This is the uh, Fossa Carolina from Charlemagne. Um, this is where the Iron Gates were um, from Trajan. So it's the area in between the two. Uh, the red are canals and the green are river navigations. Um, and the, the red tended to have been built. Um, the green ones, these going north from the Vienna area up to the Elba and the Oder <coughs> are still being promoted today. Um, so it is one of those things that perhaps eventually that it was the great idea of the Habsburg Empire was this north-south link through Vienna. Um, and for them, waterways were actually quite important. You don't, we, we don't think of Austria as being an important country for inland waterways, but they certainly were. So what happened in this country? And we had our own 30 years war, a little bit behind time, a little bit shorter, in terms of the civil war. And that, again, decimated our economy. Uh, in particular, it did a lot of damage in Ireland, where there were lots of uh, fighting on the East Coast, and there's a lot of destruction of things. Um, and the poor old Irish, national, you know, traditional Irish people got kicked out to Leinster here on the west coast, uh, where uh, while the western side was taken over by more English sort of families. Um, but the whole problem in, in Ireland uh, is a little bit more complicated than that. But what we need to remember from inland waterways is that they were looking to develop the economy to pay for the damage that the Civil War had done. And there, into this story then comes the Englishman, Andrew Yarrington, who produced this wonderful book, England's Improvement by Sea and Land, to outdo the Dutch without fighting. And it's again, it's, it's recognizing that the Dutch are the big economic power at the time, how do we go about getting our bit of the cake, so to speak? And Yarrington wrote this book, which is, it's, it's a fantastic book in many ways. Uh, it tells you how to develop a, a sound banking system, which are, I have sent details to my local MP, but uh, I don't think they're really interested. Uh, but what he did as well is suggest that if you want to develop the economy, you must develop inland waterways. And so here on the right is his scheme for developing the River Avon. This is going to be Stratford-on-Avon with all these things, a coal yard, a timber yard, a granary, um, brickworks. And he was saying, if you develop inland transport, you're going to develop trade at the same time. It wasn't quite as simple as that, but here in uh, 1687, the idea uh, was already 
sort of coming about. Sorry, it's 1677, I got that wrong. Um, and the idea was taken up. And I think the most important sort of place it, it was taken up was on the Air and Calder navigation. Uh, this is Leeds, top one picture of Leeds in 1715. But this is the first time that a successful inland waterway was built, which really did encourage trade. It was built by local people to develop their local economy. And that is the key to the whole Industrial Revolution. It's local people doing things in their local area that they're going to make money out of. And the Aaron Calder is the one that actually did, the, did that. And it's interesting to look at the um, booklets promoting the, the uh, Trent and Mersey Canal. The example they hold up there is the Aaron Calder. <coughs> that it, it was opened by 1704. By the time we're promoting canals in the 1750s, 1760, that was long enough for people to have seen that this waterway had been of great benefit to the area. It also happened on the, the West Coast as well at the same time, principally guided by Thomas Steers, uh, who had been in William of Orange's army and brought over ideas he'd seen in the Low Countries and he developed a whole area of canals in Ireland and in the north of England. He was actually involved with the Newry Canal but the Newry Canal is earlier than that. From Yarrington scheme uh, he had this idea for a, a ring canal around uh, Dublin and the idea was taken up really quite effectively in Ireland and Richard Castle published a book on uh, building inland waterways in 1729 and in fact in that year the Irish Parliament established commissioners of inland navigation and they got Castle to start building the Newry Canal uh, he stopped, he, he went off to build houses instead, he could make more money at that. But Steers took up the scheme and it opened in, in uh, 1742, the first successful canal in the country. And you know, the, the Irish government came in on that. They wanted to build, they thought, oh, we can get in on this thing and build canals. And so it was sort of government funded. Uh, we've got the Grand Canal, this is Lock 13. Originally, this was going to be a lock 136 feet long, 18 feet wide, uh, but they realised it was going a bit over the top and it was narrowed down. So the actual gates at the end are the 13 foot wide, 13 foot six gates that they have in Ireland. They also had a Kilkenny Canal, started building 1755, and we saw that the gate, the some of the, the, the structures are still there. They had, they were locks of similar sort of size. And these were partly government finance schemes and governments always have grand ideas and they're never completed. Uh, and it's quite interesting that what happened in Ireland is completely different to what happened in England. In Ireland where they had these government sponsored waterways in England, they were all private. So these are some of the early acts and patents. Um, the black ones are English industrial canals. So you can start seeing they start with the Aaron Calder, Douglas Navigation, Mersey and Irwell, coming through until they eventually get to the Bridgewater Canal. So these 60 years are really important. The other ones we've got the the red uh, blue ones are in Ireland and the other ones are sort of south of England they tend to be more agricultural based and were never really particularly important. So why is the Duke actually regarded as this, this sort of important person? 
Um, he did a grand tour, he'd seen what was going on in Italy. He came back, developed his ideas. His first canal was local. His fourth one was very much regional and looked at you know, controlling the whole of the system. Um, when you look at the money, it didn't actually spend an awful lot compared to other schemes of the time. Uh, but again, he, he was, it all came out of his own pocket, so I can sort of forgive him that. And we ended up with the early schemes, the narrow canals, uh, the early narrowboats. I'll mention this, this is uh, 1795 drawing of a narrowboat, very similar to contemporary drawings. We then get the canal mania coming along and the development of inland waterways. The early ones up to 1780, these that tend to be the more successful canals, ones built subsequently, there are quite a lot which are unsuccessful. Um, and we could go into that uh, at another date. British engineering wasn't particularly advanced, but you can see how this is the, the finance going in. It was sort of built up um, until it reached a sort of peak. Uh, and even after railways were open, we were still putting quite a bit of money into keeping canals open. And this is the last slide showing how we were using waterways up until about the 1750s. And then there's this rapid increase of the canal age up to about 1850. And with the introduction of railways, the, the length of canal being used goes off, right? So that, that's a very introduction to a very brief introduction to um, the canal age and where it came from. It's not a British story. It happened all over the all over Europe uh, and a little bit elsewhere. Uh, but I hope you've perhaps learned something a bit different and hopefully we'll be able to see. Uh, I'll be able to answer any uh, questions. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Mike. That was really interesting. Such a lot to take in and lots of things. I thought I knew a bit about canals, but lots of things that I didn't know. For the sharp-eyed amongst you, you'll notice that my background has changed because I've moved into a different room so that my husband can join me. Um, Derek Humph is here. So, <laughs> um, I've got one, well, I've got two questions now in the Q&A box. So if anybody's got any questions about Mike's talk, then, then please put them in the Q&A box. So the first one, Mike, is when did narrow boats in the UK first start to run in pairs? And when did it become commonplace? I think that, that's probably something you can't really answer uh, because we, we know so little about what happened in the early days. Um, in in the, the book I've just published, there we are, that, that's, that's my new book, uh, published through the Railway and Canal Historical Society. I do look at the start of narrowboats, uh, why they ended up with that, the size they are, and a little bit, a little bit about the economics of it. Um, the author, the, the, the book is basically a translation of an Austrian book on canal building. The engineer having visited England in 1795 and built a narrow canal in Vienna. Um, in this, he, he talks about going through Prestonbrook Tunnel. And they went through in groups of boats. Uh, they were all coupled together and all the boatmen helped in legging through. So it, it does suggest that there was a lot of sort of joint working uh, in some way. Now, whether they worked then in pairs, uh, actually on the canal, um, it is possible because all the early ideas about you know, why you would build a narrow canal, uh, they all suggest 
that they need to be half the width but the same length as the wide canals so that a narrow boat you can fit two narrow boats into one wide lock and that would suggest that they were thinking about uh, working in pairs um, but it, it's one of those questions that we'll, I doubt whether I actually ever really know the answer uh, definitively uh, the, ne the uh, next, can you see the questions, Mark? Yes, yeah. Okay. Why do you think they were, they were slow getting going in the UK? I think it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, our, our governments were always very different to, to those on the continent. Um, it might have, might have been because of land, the way that land is owned in this country. Because we're very small, land ownership has, has always been very important, which is why we have a lot of fences and hedgerows compared to the rest of Europe. Um, and because that, it, was, it, it might have been more difficult to organise. Uh, obviously, getting a, an Act of Parliament, you've got to get all the people on your route, on your side, or at least the majority of them. Whereas Elsewhere in Europe, it would have been just done by diktat. Um, their problem was, was the distances were just too big for 18th century technology to allow ca canals to be developed. It would have been just too, too much of a major project, uh, compared, certainly compared to the, the length of canals in this country. Um, What's the glass trade in developing canals? I've not, I've, I've not come across anything on the glass trade. Uh, I'd, I'd have to sort of think about that. Um, it's, it's quite difficult that, that you sometimes find things that uh, waterways are, are really good for bulk cargoes. What they tend not to be good at is high value cargoes. And I suspect that glass was becoming high value. Um, and then it's, it's, it's always a sort of a juggling act between how safe things are from being stolen compared to how likely they are to get damaged. Um, <clears throat> and certainly in textiles, uh, very little finished cloth was sent by water uh, because by the time it's been finished and printed, it was too high value uh, to go on a, a, a boat. And it was much easier to send it in small packages by uh, cart or pack horse. Um, whether it was the same with, with glass, I'm not sure. Uh, next one. Change by the reason when. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the time for passing through uh, a lock would be um, <clears throat> quite important in, in their sort of development. Although you have to think that going back, uh, time wasn't such a major con consideration. Uh, it, it is one of these sort of balancing acts again uh, against the cost of doing something and how effective you're going to be. Um, it was probably the water usage. Uh, and again, th th this comes from the number of boats using it against the amount of water that's needed or that's available um, for it to sort of be feasible to, to use. Uh, you do have to remember that we're talking, you know, if you go back 300 years, the amount of goods that are being moved are very, very small compared to what we think of a, as trade today. Um, and so their solutions could be much simpler than ours because they didn't have such a vast amount to carry. Uh, 
lack of development in the UK system in relation to Europe. Um, basically railways uh, that the problem we have, you know, water transport, the big cost is getting the cargo into the boat and getting the cargo out. So you need to be carrying it quite a long distance to make it really economic. You know, and th there are local trades, some of the things like coal where it can be loaded very close to the colliery, unloaded very close to the user. Uh, <clears throat> that will remain economic, but for general trade, the distances in this country are too small to make water transport really economic. Um, <clears throat> it's much easier, or it, it was much easier in the 19th century when railways came about. There's also this sort of change from the early phase in the 19th century, um, when industry was quite simple and we weren't producing the vast amounts that were needed, uh, that we would, would need transport, as opposed to the second half where technology had really developed and we were going into uh, the export trade in a big way. And that's when <clears throat> we really started to, to need transport. By that time, railways were sort of answering that need. If you've got a successful canal, it managed to keep going, you know, perhaps until the First World War, uh, before it dwindled off. <clears throat> Whereas for the less successful canals, they failed very quickly when they came up against railway traffic, tra travel, or tra uh, competition. Post initial development. Um, not quite, quite sure how can so answer that. There, there, there is a, I, I do think there were phases in uh, British canal building. We have the early phase, sort of 1750 to 1780, uh, where canals are built by local people involved with local trade for them to develop that trade. Whereas when you get to the canal mania, people think that you put, you build a canal and you make money out of the canal. You don't, you make money out of the trade that develops by, you know, the, by encouraging manufacture. That's where the money is made. Transport will never actually make money. Uh, it's always an additional cost on production. Um, <clears throat> and so, the early canals were built by people that had factories or they had coal mines and they benefited directly from putting money into canals. The canal mania ones, a lot of them were just people putting money into canals because they, they thought they would make money and those canals never did. Uh, <clears throat> Are the lessons that can be learned today? Uh, there are, uh, but I think you're gonna to have to wait until I've written your next book. Um, I'm, I'm, ha having completed one book, I'm now going to look at the British Isles as a whole and compare what happened in Ireland and to a certain extent Scotland as against England. And so it's comparing how what happens when you get government involvement against private involvement and what were the, the benefits of each and what are the uh, failures of each and how do you then get a, a good transport policy. And I do think there's an awful lot to learn from looking at canal transport. Um, the really good thing about canals is they're small enough to actually <clears throat> be able to um, research and make positive sort of, or a meaningful result out of that research. Railway transport, just get, it's just so vast a thing that um, <clears throat> it's, it's difficult to do 
uh, as is um, <clears throat> looking at road transport where there probably aren't records kept. I've got just right. about look, saying that it's fragility of grass. It's uh, certainly, um, there is something and looking at glass, I mean, I, I go back to the, uh, the canal where I served my time, which was the St. Helens. I, I actually served my time in a, in a, a glass factory uh, right alongside St. Helens Canal. And the glass actually only, glass production actually really only developed uh, after, the, after the Sankey Brook is opened in a, in a sort of large way. There, there were small factories, but is that because uh, it provided transport for the, the product or because it provided transport for the raw materials? I'm, I'm, I'm not really too sure about that. Uh, and it, but it, it is the key to whole, you know, to looking at canal economics. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That's um, really good. So some, someone's put a question in the chat box, but I think the answer probably will, will take too long and we're already overrunning slightly. The question, the question was, what's known about canals built by the built in this country by the Romans? But I think we'll leave that for another time. Um, there, there, there is a book. Just hang on. I'll just get it here because I've been doing something. Main... Someone, someone has already answered part the question partly about the yeah. mentioning the Fosdyke and the Cardyke in Lincolnshire. That, that's the book to get. Right. Is waterways and canal building in medieval England. Oh, well, there um, you go. I'm, there I'm, you I'm go. not convinced of some of the things there, but uh, it's certainly that, that there are pe people have done something on that. There's always more questions than than the there are answers and not enough time in your life to find yeah. out everything that there is to know. Uh, because I thought I started off thinking I knew a bit about canals, but there's what what there's so much more to learn. And just to plug for Mike's book again, it, it, Mike, Mike has written many books about canals. They're all really interesting. And uh, Paul Rogers is saying he wants to put his order in for the next book. I'm sure there are ways of finding, finding out. So we've all had a really interesting, entertaining evening. My thanks to Mike on, on behalf of myself and on behalf of everybody. I've got a few comments in the chat box saying how much they've appreciated the talk. So we ended up, if people are interested, we ended up with 89 participants um, at the webinar, which is great. And um, if anybody has any questions, then my email address is um, wendy.humphreys at waterways.org.uk or I think most people know my email address anyway. So if you've got any questions that you haven't had the opportunity to get the answer to, or you want to say anything more, then drop me an email. Before I go, I'd like to say, um, if you enjoyed that talk by Mike, he will be doing another one for us on the 16th of March. And he'll be talking about uh, 50 years of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal Society, 50 no, years no. of his involvement. I'm talking about my 50 years on the canal. The, right. uh, the Canal Society was set, I set up 25 years ago. So that's only half the story. Okay. Uh, and we'll probably be starting with the IWA National Rally at Liverpool. Well, through to Kennet and the Canal Society's boat. Even so more. We'll, we'll bring the more, two together. Yeah, even more reason for IWA members to come along to that Zoom meeting then. So the details for that are on uh, IWA TV already if you want to register. And we do also have two other Zoom talks, one on the 12th of January, which is community moorings uh, in Scotland, and one on the 9th of February, and that's about canal lifts and inclines. We've also got 
in our branch, our, our Lancashire and Cumbria branch, we have started our live social meetings after a gap of over a year. And we had our first meeting uh, the last Wednesday in September. Our social meetings are the last Wednesday of the month and they are held in Chorley at Primrose Gardens. Details are on, on the website or and into empath topics. But our next speaker is Carrie House. Um, she is the community engagement officer for the, the Stainton Aqueduct, Hincaster Tunnel and Sedgwick Aqueduct projects. And she's been in post for three years and she's got a lot to tell us. She had a lot to tell us before, when she'd only been in the post a couple of months, so I'm sure she's got a lot more now. So on that note then, I, I, I will say thank you again to Mike. Really interesting, so much knowledge. And if anybody wants to find out more of Mike's knowledge, he's written lots of books that you, you can find out about. And thank you very much to everyone for attending. And uh, I'll close the meeting and I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's always very abrupt, but uh, good evening, everybody. Enjoy the, the next couple of hours of the evening and hopefully we'll see you again, either at the live meetings or at our Zoom meetings. Good night.